want to thank you, Kate, for that very gracious uh, welcome. And it's great to be with you. And um, I'm not with you that often at Metro. So tonight is not just um, this week's sermon. I want to share with you what I sense, a pre prophetic word, really, for the year. And so, uh, I, I, as Kate said, I feel called to a life of prayer. So seek to give extended time in prayer. And one of the things at the beginning of the year when we have our week of prayer and fasting is just to sense what God might be saying for us as a church. Not the only thing that God is saying, but maybe particular emphasis at this time. And one of the things I suppose I need to say at first is that it doesn't mean when we get to the end of the year, that's the end of the word. So I could test you as to whether you remember what last year's word was, but last year's word I felt particularly was pursuing his presence. And my prayer and hope is that as we come to the end of the year, you're now, it's part of your life is to be pursuing his presence. And we just want to build on that. What, what, how do we build on that? Um, remember we shared how that for the presence of God, sometimes people feel it, well, it's just something that happens to you. You can't pursue it. You, know, you come to church and you feel God's presence. You leave church and you, know, you leave God's presence. But how do we pursue God's presence? And scripture has those amazing words, which we refer to even earlier tonight. And that is draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So something I can do that can actually draw out God's presence. And so for this year, I want to build on that. And uh, what I sense is a kind of prophetic word that already in these first few months of the year has already been really significant for me, but it's these simple words I felt God promising. Expect, expect a fresh wave of my spirit. Now, there's a number of ways in which I felt that expressed. First, express, expect a fresh wave of my spirit in prayer. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight. But there are also some other aspects of that about a fresh wave of God's spirit in worship, in witness, in words and works and wonders and way of life. So during the course of the year, whenever I'm with you, I'll try and build a little bit on some of those other words as well. But tonight particularly, expecting. And it's not just about you know, it happening. How do we expect? Faith is a substance of things hoped for, a sense of expectation. How do we expect that fresh wave of God's spirit in prayer? So we're reading, first of all, from Philippians chapter 1, and this is where Paul speaks about his prayer life. And I suppose one of the things that particularly comes out in the beginning of it is just the way God, that Paul prayed. There was a sense of joy about prayer. For many of us, prayer is one of those things we all feel we ought to pray more. In fact, usually hearing a talk about prayer, we end up feeling a bit guilty because we ought to pray more often or more depth, etc. But tonight, I want to inspire you to really sense how God can help us in our praying. Because Paul says here that whenever he prays, he always prays with joy. Goodness, how do you keep that freshness? Listen to these words. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers, not just the odd, in all my prayers, for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Father, we pray that here tonight, You'd come now by your Holy Spirit, as we've been inviting in our worship. Come, Holy Spirit, come now. Spirit of truth, guide us into truth. That kind of truth that just doesn't, just a passing impression, not just information that we hear, but Lord, impact as we pray with your word. Somehow it'll have a, not just a challenge, but a, a changing effect on our lives. Lord, teach us to pray. May we sense tonight that real stirring of expectation for a fresh wave of your spirit in prayer. In Jesus' lovely and precious name. Amen. Amen. So here in Philippians, Paul is saying, in all my prayers, that's whenever he prays, and he says, for all of you, not just, you know, the odd person, but for all of you. Now, for those who are a regular part of Metro here, I pray for you every week by name. In fact, I work my way through the kind of fellowship list each week, and, and I find a great joy in doing that. And one of the things I've been praying over recent weeks has been this very prophetic word, Lord, today, just give a fresh wave of your spirit. Or even that word from last year, still one of the ones I pray, Lord, just make your presence real today to Bill or Jackie or Susie or maybe and there's something about prayer that can really be really fresh that sense of joy but how do we keep that freshness you know when Jesus most wanted his own followers to pray with him it was in the garden of Gethsemane and he asked them to watch and pray it was a time of agony and anguish for him when he comes back to them they're fast asleep do you ever fall asleep when you're trying to pray? 
You ever feel too tired to pray? Ever feel the distraction and discouragement sometimes, a disappointment that sometimes robs you of prayer? Jesus' response to this situation as he sees them asleep again, he says this. He says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. How then, in the weakness of our human flesh, do we find the help of the Holy Spirit, witnessing with our spirit in prayer? That's what we're just going to unfold a little first. We'll take another scripture. This is taken from Romans chapter 8. And this is literally where scripture is speaking. It's an amazing verse of scripture. These two verses help us to see, I think, one of the clearest passages of scripture as to how prayer works. So he says this in Romans 8. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We feel too tired, worn out, discouraged to pray. How does he do that? We do not know what we ought to pray. Now, sometimes when we, we feel tired and discouraged, uh, and particularly when we feel we don't know what to pray, we don't bother to pray. What's the point of prayer if you don't know what to pray? And you feel too tired anyway. But that's the very time when often we can experience the, the most powerful way in which the Spirit helps us in our praying. So this is what it goes on to say. But the Spirit helps us in our praying, uh, even when we do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Now, keep that scripture up for a moment because we're going to unfold it a bit as we go through. So here I am, I don't know what to pray, and yet I feel a heartache, God has stirred in me, a, a concern for someone or a situation. I remember many years ago, um, sending a young couple here from Bristol out to Africa to serve God in a very difficult and challenging situation there. So much so we were praying for them every day, and this particular night, uh, we were going to bed and we prayed for them, but then I woke up in the early hours of the morning with my heart. It's all I could say, I felt a real heartache. I felt a real urgency to pray, but I didn't know what to pray. Hey, I hadn't seen them for weeks, I had contact, I didn't know, I didn't know what situation was happening what they were going through at that moment but I felt a real heartache a heartache that I just couldn't go back to sleep with so I, I'm and as, as I'm sensing that stirring in prayer I felt the Holy Spirit help me and I began to sense a release of my spirit while I was praying with even in a language I couldn't understand but some I felt some was being released from in within me and I couldn't wait in the morning to, to communicate to them. It wasn't easy. They were in Africa, so it took a little while to get the message to them. But I shared with them the story and how I'd been praying and how that night I'd really had them on my heart. And I'd felt a real witness of God's spirit stirring. I even told them the time when I prayed because I could remember it. And uh, it was a little while before I got a message back. from It takes a little while coming back from Africa. And obviously we didn't have email just then. But uh, um, they were really encouraged. Rob, it was so encouraging just to get your message because that night we were traveling down to South Africa and we're on a really dangerous road. It was almost known as kind of death trap where, and as in the middle of the night we were going along and we just went past and went through and just missed a fatal accident where other folk were killed. But we, we almost were part of it, he said. And as we came the other side of it, we, we stopped the car and just felt a breath of relief. We said to each other as we looked at our watch and said, someone somewhere, must be praying for us. And it was the exact time that I'd put in my note that I'd been praying for them. Now, you might say, but God is the God of the universe. The God, why would he bother to wake you up in the middle of the night? Couldn't he just do it? Couldn't he just... Sort of, but God, this amazing way in which it says that the sovereign Lord does nothing of his purpose this year on earth without revealing it prophetically through his people. This is what makes joy, uh, prayer a joy for me. This is what brings an excitement. It's not just my shopping list of my needs, but I'm part of those eternal purposes of God. God is, God is fulfilling his purposes through our prayers. And to be caught up in that, in prayer, is something amazing. But what does this mean? That I don't know what I ought to pray. I don't know what God's will is in that situation. And yet the Holy Spirit intercedes for me with a kind of inner ache and inner groaning uh, but that words cannot express. Now, the, the word used in Greek here in Romans is the word glossalia. It's the word we translate as tongues in the Bible. Now, you may say, oh, I'm not too sure about all that. Or for some folk, tongue can be seem, seem something mysterious almost. And you may even be brought up in a context where sometimes folk even feel, you know, it's something of the devil or it's something that ended with the New Testament revelation, as it were. But what is it then? Because even a rational person might logically say, but God has made us articulate creatures. 
God has made us rational creatures. We're able, that's what makes us distinctive and unique as human beings, as it were. Uh, and, and we're able to express our feelings uh, through language. We can articulate them. That's true. And it's important for us to value that and appreciate that. But God has also given us a capacity for expression that goes beyond words. So you just think for a moment, let's take the two extremes of human passion and feeling where we, we, we feel a deep inner stirring. Let's take the first one, let's take, um, let's take joy. You know, where you really feel a sense of joy, uh, even of laughter, of fun. Uh, now, I'm not very good at telling jokes, but suppose tonight I were to tell you the best joke you've heard in years. And I, I, I'm telling it to you, and I get to that strap line, and that final strap line I tell you, and you all, because you're rational, articulate creatures, you all sit there pan face and say, that is funny, that is funny. What was that little flapping there of a diaphragm? Do we call it laughter? What is laughter? Inarticulate? It's not an expression of words, it's not, and yet it is a release of feelings. It's a response. Now, you may be brought up, of course, in a very sober, serious context where laughter is considered as a frivolous thing and we don't laugh, you know, unnecessarily, as it were. And, and of course, this is true in many ways that our background, our history uh, can shape sometimes our expressions, even spiritually. Let's take the other extreme. The extreme of sadness. Heartache, grief, bereavement, suffering, sorrow. Now again, something could really happen sad with you and your friend or in your family and you really feel sad, but you could sit together and just say to each other, I feel sad, I feel sad. That's an articulate, rational expression of the feelings you've got. Or you could find you're crying, even sobbing, even sobbing deeply. What is that? I mean, it's not words, and yet it's an expression of an inner being. I remember praying with somebody once, and uh, they're now a senior church leader in those days. They were just the early days of their leadership, but they've been brought up in a very traditional kind of background, a very loving and caring background, but um, uh, somehow tears were not a, a... I mean, sometimes you can be brought up in a kind of macho culture where, you know, to cry, we never cry, you know. But tears are an important part of expressing grief and heartache. But this person came to me, and particularly, they were concerned about the whole subject of tongues and what it means to, to speak in a language not your own, to find a release of your spirit where your, pray, your spirit is praying. And, and they said, but Rob, what does that mean? And so we went through the scriptures together and shared together, and eventually at the end of it, they said they'd, they'd love just to be open. I said, if you're really open and genuinely seeking, I'm very happy to pray for you. As I prayed for them and anointed them with oil and prayed over them, they were just stood up by a couch, we were praying together, and they, they fell back into this couch and he began to sob so deeply, really deep sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. And he said to me, Rob, he said, I, I'm not unhappy, I feel something released in me. And, and as he began to feel that release of his spirit, he said, you know, I haven't, I haven't cried for over 21 years, he said. But somehow in that moment, there was a release. Now, if this is true of our human passions, of joy or sadness that God has given us. Now, you might say, well, you know, Rob, I, I'm not one for uh, too much crying, but let me just say, you've got tear ducts. All of us have got them. So God has created us with the capacity to do it. And God has created us all with the capacity for being able to, so, to know what it is to pray with our spirit, to know that release of our spirit. You know those times in worship where you're bursting at the seams and words seem so limited, mm -hmm. but God gives that release of his spirit. Or in prayer when you're feeling a heartache for a situation and, some, and somehow God releases in your spirit that witness of his spirit with your, with your spirit in prayer, that inner release. Now, it's interesting in Scripture because um, there's quite a bit that speaks about prayer and Corinthians gives us a, lots of illustration of how it works. And it's not that once you pray with your spirit, that means that's the only way you pray. In fact, Paul quite clearly says, I will pray with my mind, I will pray with my spirit, I will sing with my mind, I will sing with my spirit. It's important for us to use our minds in articulate prayer. When someone has shared with us information, knowledge, and we know about a situation, we pray into it, that we're using our minds and that's important we're doing that. But there are times, like Scripture is speaking of here in Romans, where we don't know what we ought to pray. We don't know what God's will is. But the Spirit helps us in that praying. 
or in scripture, even when Paul speaks about tongues, you know, we don't actually read with Paul any example of him in a situation praying in tongues. And yet Paul clearly says, I pray in tongues more than any of you. So it must have been an experience in supporting his life and worship and his personal walk with God where prayer and worship, he felt that release in tongues. And for all of us, there's something very powerful when we sense God's spirit witnessing with our spirit. Even the first experience of becoming a Christian, you know what the Bible says? His spirit witnesses with our spirit, Abba Father. We belong with a sense of an inner witness of God's spirit with us. Now, this goes on to explain a little more of how this works in prayer. Because if, see, I, I'm praying for that couple in Africa. I don't know what to pray. I don't know what I ought to pray. I don't know what God's will is for them. But as I pray, this is what it says. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with words to Greek runes. And then he, God has put on my heart a heartache for them. God who searches my heart sees that heartache, conscious that I'm now reaching out, I'm praying, I'm reaching out to God in prayer and sensing that release. He who searches our hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with God's will. So though I never knew how I ought to pray for this situation, I didn't know what God's will was for this situation, but the Holy Spirit is now interceding with me in me according to God's will, the will of God, releasing God's purpose. And that can be a very powerful thing when we sense it's, it's not just a shopping list of my needs, but it's sensing being caught up in God's will and purpose for situations. In that first scripture, if you can just go back to Philippians chapter 1 again, in this scripture, Paul speaks about this confidence which makes such a difference to our prayer life. It's a confidence that he who began that good work in it will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. What is it to faithfully hold on in prayer, to persist in prayer, to sense that refreshment, even though we've been praying for a long time for a situation? How do we experience that? Um, here in Bristol, some of you may um, have heard of George Muller, and he had this amazing life of prayer and faith in God. He lived many years ago, and he began an orphanage, which the, the orphanage homes are still there today. In fact, Muller House is, is there now, where you can see a, a museum with all the artifacts and things back from those early days. It's a remarkable experience. If you ever get a chance to go and see the museum there up on Ashley Down. But Muller also kept a record of his prayer life. And I mean, if I showed you my diary today, and if I still got it, but uh, it would just be I keep it in my pocket, so it's about that size. But Muller's diary, or the journals of Muller, was great thick volumes, as it were. You can still see them today, and he'd record his prayers, and he'd often keep a space on the other side for the answer to the prayer. So he would put a date against when he prayed, and, the, and a date against when God answered it. And this one particularly, I mean, there are some amazing stories of Muller's. Perhaps one of the famous ones um, would have been so, so Muller would. One of the distinctive things about his life of faith was that he, he eventually looked after over 10,000 orphans, but he never appealed or told anyone the needs. He just prayed to God and saw God answer prayer. And there was sometimes when it was really at the last minute, the story particularly of one of his situations where the orphans were there and uh, they'd run out of food completely. And uh, they, it's breakfast time and the, the helpers say, well, what do we do? He said, well, j j lay up the tables. We haven't got any food. Never mind, lay up. What do we do now? We'll get the children in and they line them all up and they sat at the table and say, what do we do now? He said, well, let's say grace together. And he said, grace, there was, no, there was no food available. As he says grace, there's a knock on the door. And in fact, there were eventually two knocks on the door. But one of them was a milkman. And the milkman in those days with the old carts would have this uh, great um, can, as it were, milk on the back. But he'd broken down outside. In order to mend his cart, he had to take the milk off. And, and so he knocks on the orphanage door. It happened just outside. He said, could you use all this milk? And so they took it in. And the next minute, there's a knock on the door. It's the baker. And he said he'd woken up early in the morning. Usually he does for bake, but this is an hour earlier than normal. And he felt God say to him to, to bake twice as much that day and to take it to the Muller orphanages. And so he did. And here, literally, as they just said grace for it, God provides for them. And there are some amazing stories like that, that from Muller's, if you haven't ever read any of those or heard, do, do take a chance to visit the, 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 the museum here in Bristol. But when Muller recorded on this particular occasion in his diary, and this was in 1844, if I'm right, in November 1844, and he had five people that weren't Christians that he'd met. I don't know if one of them might have even been the, the milkman, but anyway, um, five people who he met who weren't Christians, but he felt this particular day, God put them on his heart. 
and he wrote down his diary. You can see the record in his diary by name, these five names of people who weren't Christian. And he was going to pray for them each day until they became Christians. And so you see the record of his diary, praying for them, etc. Well, it was 18 months before the first one became a Christian. So that was a fair while to wait, but there was much rejoicing. And every, every time a person comes to faith in Jesus, there's great rejoicing in heaven. It says all heaven rejoices. I was saying just earlier today that uh, I don't know how long they rejoice for because uh, on average today, because today around the world, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ is growing more rapidly than ever in history, even more than the day of Pentecost when it was 3,000 one day today. Every few minutes, someone will be becoming a Christian. Now, if in heaven, I don't know how long they rejoice for, but I expect it's a few minutes, it must mean there's continual rejoicing day and night in heaven or people becoming Christians. That's why sometimes to catch something of that, you know, kingdom of God on earth, catching a spirit of that heaven on earth is to catch something of that sense of expectancy. Anyway, after 18 months, the first one, he kept praying. It was five years before the second one. He kept praying faithfully. It was 11 years before the next one. And then 25 years before the fourth one. Now, four out of five is good going, you might say. But then Muller died. And you might say, well, there we are. God didn't answer all his prayers, did he? Well, here's one of the amazing truths about prayer. Prayer outlives the prayer. Prayer outlives the prayer. So for us today, there may be a granny or a great granny who prayed for you, who's long dead, but actually you're benefiting today from her prayers. And this is what happened with Muller. When he died, he'd had such an amazing impact on this city. Thousands of people's lives have been touched through his testimony and what he'd done. So much so that in fact, uh, when Muller died, they named the longest road in Bristol after him. That's called Muller Road. You may be still there today, Muller Road. That was named after him. Above it, on top of there, are the Ashley Down huge houses and, and, and shops throughout the city closed. In fact, the entourage for his funeral was three miles long going through the city, as it were. And there on that fun at that funeral was number five on his prayer list. And he became a Christian that day at his funeral. Wonderful. Now, when it says here in Philippians about being confident that he who began a good work, even like for Muller, when God began that work, because he felt that stirring of prayer, and then you say, but wait, 18 months went by, then five years went by, 11 years went by, 25 years, but God was at work bringing completion. But the amazing thing, it says that carry it on until completion, until the day of Christ Jesus. So ultimately, of course, ultimately in that day of Christ Jesus, there'll be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering. There'll be the ultimate answer to all our prayers. But what is it to hold on in prayer? Sometimes when we've been praying for, you know, I often say, you know, you pray for something and if you haven't seen the answer by a week or two, you've begun to think God didn't hear it. And after a few months, you've forgotten what you prayed. And when God does eventually answer it, you don't even recognize the answer. It may be very different to what you'd expected. What is it somehow to have a confidence? A confidence that he who began that will bring it to, and to hold on to God in prayer, that persistence, that faithfulness in prayer. I've told some of you the story of uh, the day I became a Christian, which was many years ago before most of you was born, were born. But um, it was all new to me. I wasn't a churchgoer. We were four boys at home. We were all rebels. And um, two aside football for us was always like a ends up as usually a, a boxing match. And it was always very competitive. And um, so it, for us, it was real challenge. And, and going to church wasn't part of our life. I'd been to church once and I only went the first day and I had a fight with a deacon's son. And so I never went again, or at least I wasn't allowed to go again. Um, uh, and so it was all a bit strange and mysterious. But a friend from school who was a keen Christian, he'd invited me. And I'd gone to this service and I really felt for the first time in my life that Jesus, the Son of God, loved me and gave himself for me. Somehow it changed everything in me. I, I felt I, I really wanted to, to experience that forgiveness, but I didn't know how to. And there was someone who was helping folk in prayer. And a person said to me, well, I often explain it just like a simple ABC. You know, A is, this is the ABC of becoming a Christian. A is to admit your need, saying sorry to God. Don't make excuses. So often we, we excuse ourselves. It wasn't my fault. It was my upbringing or my background or my mates. No, just say sorry to God. And then B is to believe that Jesus, as the Son of God, gave his life for you on the cross. And C is to commit your life to him. Now, I said to this friend, but I wouldn't know how to do that. He said, well, you could just pray and just those three simple steps, say sorry to God and thank Jesus for dying for you and just commit. I said, but I wouldn't know how to pray. I'm, I'm, I don't know. 
he said, well, would you like me to pray with you? And so he helped me just to pray step by step. And as I prayed, I felt something change inside of me. It was all so, I really knew something had happened. And he said to me then, as I was going home, he said, look, he said, you, you need to share with somebody else. Now you become a Christian and pray for them. So I get home, uh, which is all completely new to me. And the first person I pray for is my younger brother. I've told you some of that remarkable story it was where my younger brother, uh, I didn't know how to pray, but I, I'd seen a picture of someone kneeling down by their bedside with their hands. So I knelt down by my bedside and started to pray. Now, my younger brother's bedroom was attached to mine. You had to go through my bedroom to get to his. So suddenly the door flies open. It was a little dark. He trips over me and, and says to me, we're swearing, what am I doing? And, and I know I should have said, I'm praying for you, John. But instead of that, I looked under the bed, so I'd lost something. And, and uh, I, I, I was still confused as to, you know, what would happen next. And in the morning, maybe he'd come out saying, hallelujah, but he didn't. He's still swearing and cursing and asking what I was doing. And I still said I'd lost something. So I didn't know what to do. So I said to my friend that day, I said, can I pray the same prayer again? He said, yeah, keep on praying, brother. And so I did. I prayed that next day and the next day and the next year, the next five years, the next 10 years, the next 50, every day of my life, the next 20 years. And then one Monday morning, uh, this amazing moment where I just felt him on my heart. I prayed for him every day, but this morning as I prayed for him, I just couldn't get him on my mind all day. Coffee time, lunch time. I went to, when I went to bed, I prayed for him. I, I woke up two o'clock in the morning, sweating all over with my younger brother on my heart. And I thought I ought to contact, maybe he was going through something, you know, some danger or some difficulty. And, but my younger brother now is a hard-nosed businessman over in South Wales, and I dare not say him I was praying. That would be like red rag to a bull. So I, I just, again, chickened out of it. And, but the next night happened again, two o'clock in the morning. And the next night, two o'clock, three nights in a row. And I knew by the fourth day I was getting bleary-eyed. I better. So uh, that evening I... I was going to phone him. Now, for some of you who may not know these things, there were these old phones with a curly wire on the end of them in those days. And so I, I, went, to, I went to reach for the phone. As I reached for the phone, the telephone went. And I pick it up. It's my younger brother. I said, why, oh, John, I'm about to phone you. He said, oh, what was that about? I said, oh, you tell me first. <laughs> then he said to me that, well, it was a remarkable story how he had woken up at two o'clock in the morning for the last three nights, sweating all over. This is my younger brother. I said, what was that? He said, I was being chased, he said. And just as I was about to get caught, I'd wake up. I said, what was chasing you? Thinking it was a wild animal. And there was a moment of quiet, which usually the embarrassment my brother would have for anything. That was, And he said, I think it was God, he said. I said, really? And so I felt the courage now to say to him, uh, you know, how I've been praying. And anyway, we met up that night on the, what was the old Seven Crossing, where the old there used to be a little service station up there as well. We didn't ever get into the service. We sat in the car park and the car steamed up for about two hours. And I shared with him that good news, that ABC of becoming a Christian. He didn't become a Christian that night, but he did two weeks later. And he's led many, many other people to the Lord. Now, I've told you that story some of you before, but this is the one up to date that's just happened. So in these last, during this last year, I said, we were four boys, three of us become Christians. That's included my youngest one then. So there's one other who's my next youngest brother, Norm. And uh, Norm been a real rebel and a black sheep of the family. And so for him, it wasn't over 20 years praying, but over 60 years every day of my life praying for imagine that. And my youngest brother, who was the one I just talked about, becoming, he was really full on. So he contacted me. This is just some, a few months back now. And he said to me, oh, Rob, he said, I, I've just sent Norm a Bible. I thought, ooh, Norm's up north. And I thought, that'll end up in the bin. So anyway, I, I called him just a few days. I said, Norm, I said, and we got chat about various things. And I sort of threw in. I said, oh, I gather, I gather John sent you a Bible. I said, what, what's happened to it? Oh, he said, I, I opened it the other day. He said, and I started looking at the first page. He said, it was one of those new Bibles with rice paper. He could hardly open it and get through it. But eventually he got, found it eventually. And, we, and he, he said, uh, I said, well, look, no, it might be helpful just to read one of the biographies of Jesus. There are four of them in the Bible. They're a bit further on because that'll give you an overview all picture of the Bible. He said, where'd you find them? And it took him about five minutes to find John's gospel, but eventually he found it. I said, why don't you read the first three chapters? And uh, I've done this with many, many people. And I said, um, I'll give you a call in a week's time and just any questions you've got from me. So he did. He said, my brother Norm, reading the Bible. And I'm amazed, but he had some really genuine questions. And so we, we did it again. It took him about two weeks, you know, next time to do the next few chapters and then another two weeks. And we got, we're getting right away on through John's gospel. We got to the last but few chapters of John, last but one, chapter 20. And in John chapter 20, it says this is the reason which John wrote the Bible, wrote the John's gospel. It says, these things have I written that you might believe that Jesus, the Christ, the son of God, and by believing have life in his name. I said, Norm, has this helped you to understand who Jesus really is, as John meant to be through the Bible, through the John's Gospel. 
He said, Rob, you can't, you can't imagine. It's really helped me to see how significant you, I never really realized that. I always thought it was just, you know, kind of superstition, like people hang a cross around their neck, he said, but, and I said, it goes on to say that you might find life in his name. Is that something you would want, Norm? He said, I think I would, he said, but I, I wouldn't know how, where to begin. I said, well, would you like me to explain to you? Now, I just sent in the week before a copy of the little Why Jesus booklet. He's right up north. So um, I said, have you got it? He said, yeah, I got it here. He said, my Bible. So he got it out and we went through it together and just explained again what it meant to become a Christian. By the end of it, we prayed together. This was my brother Norm praying aloud, saying, oh God, I'm sorry for all the wrong. And he's lived a fairly checkered life, you know. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying. And my tears, were, I was on the phone, but tears rolled down my face. This is my younger brother. But God has been faithful. I mean, we've just finished now. So that was a finished Romans. That was his choice, you know, et cetera. But we did it last week. And uh, I was just telling him the amazing story in Romans. We got to that last but one chapter in Romans chapter 15 and verse 13. And it says his amazing words. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. You trust in him. You may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I said, you know, Norm, do you remember that when my wife, Pam, she was diagnosed with cancer and breast cancer and she had to go for a mastectomy just here in Bristol at French age. And the day it was happening, it was quite a moving day. Pam was a little tearful, as, you know, something of your whole femininity with you, having your breast removed. And we were about to go uh, that morning to the hospital and our daily reading that morning was Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you all, joy and peace, you trust in him. You may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. As he went out the front door, there was a, um, a postman who just dropped in one or two letters, and one of them was an envelope with a card inside of it. Dear Pam, just thinking of you today as you go for your operation. And I just felt God gave me this verse for you. Yeah, you can guess what it was. Romans 15, verse 13, the very same verse. That's what we mean by sometimes God prophetically confirming a word. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace, you trust in him. May all flow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're on our way to the hospital now, and Pam is really feeling quite stirred with a sense of, whereas before it had been a kind of foreboding, but a sense of hope and expectancy. And as we go in French, just inside the hospital, there's a little chapel nearby there, and they had one of those boards outside with a luminous text on it, and this big luminous text, and it says, Romans 15, verse 13, may the God of hope... Fill you will join me. By the time we were in the hospital, we were overflowing. And Pam sat down next to the person who was also waiting for the same operation. She was a doctor, a GP, and uh, she was also going for just operation. And Pam had an amazing conversation with her. Next few days, they were in hospital together. And Pam led her to the Lord and just felt, and since then, has helped many other people, particularly in that whole area of, of breast cancer, what it's meant. But God can somehow faithfully speak to us through his words. So for Norm, um, I, I was sharing with him because he, he was aware of Pam and the operation she'd had, etc. But just how scripture can come alive to us. But this for me was God's faithfulness. My brother, that's all my brothers now. But over many years, it wasn't as if it happened, you know, the next day as it were, but over all those years. But I have a confidence that when he begins that good work, he will bring it to completion. For you today, maybe there are things in your life that you're struggling with and maybe you've prayed about and wonder whether even God's heard the prayer. You've given up on it perhaps sometimes or what does it mean to sense a fresh wave of God's Holy Spirit in prayer? That's what I'm going to pray for tonight for each of us. I want it in my life. So already these past few months, I have felt wave after wave. Some things would make the hair stand on the back of your neck with just sensing a fresh wave of God's Spirit in prayer. So let's just stand together and I'm going to pray and... Um, just be open. As you stand, just have your hands open, ready to receive. God is much more willing to give than we're often ready to receive. Things in our lives sometimes just hold us back. We may be disappointed sometimes in feeling God hasn't answered our prayers or discouragement or human weakness. Tonight, God wants to help us in that weakness by, us, by his spirit. Even as in our worship tonight, we have Sung, pour out your spirit, Lord. Come now, come, Holy Spirit. Come. Fill us afresh, Lord. Fill us to overflowing, Lord. God of hope. For some of us tonight, where there are situations in our lives that seem hopeless and helpless, oh God, fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in you that we may overflow with hope. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Come now, Lord. Grant to us, I pray, a fresh wave 
of your Holy Spirit in prayer. This week, Lord, whenever we pray, Lord, we just sense that fresh wave of your Spirit. In Jesus' lovely and precious name. Amen.